Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Karen Doyle, and I'm director of CTAM Europe. I hope you're all feeling well today and having a good week. I'm pleased to introduce today's presenter, who you can see there on screen, all ready to go. Simon Murray, who is Principal Analyst at Digital TV Research, who are London-based. They publish over 25 reports a year, and the forecasts and analysis in these reports cover more than 130 countries. Today's webinar is focused mainly on the European OTT and pay TV forecasts and how COVID-19 is affecting the TV sector. If you have any questions along the way, please submit them using the Q&A button and Simon will answer them at the end of the session, which is due to last around 30 minutes or so. Today's recording will be available on the members only section of ctameurope.com and I'll be sending out temporary membership information to any non-members who have registered for today's webinar. So I will thank you again for joining and I will hand you over swiftly to Simon. Thank you. Thanks, Karen, and um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, let's push on. Um, I think uh, what we've seen from the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, already, as, as far as it affects European TV, is a surge in S1 subscriptions. Uh, Netflix posted very good results for the first quarter, and yesterday Disney uh, produced some quite interesting results as well for its Disney Plus service. Uh, on the negative side, there's lower advertiser confidence at the moment. Um, and um, what we've seen is lower AVOD growth for 2020. Now we're assuming that the um, we are assuming that the worst of the of the pandemic will be over by the middle of the year. Um, if it goes on any longer, there may be subscriber fatigue. Um, and which will see people thinking that they've seen everything they want to see in a, um, a platform's catalogue and will cancel their subscription. And of course, uh, another problem in the future, if it goes on any longer, is a production pipeline freeze. No, no production has taken place at the moment. Uh, Netflix announced yesterday plans to uh, resume production in some places very shortly, but uh, that's no by no means all the places that it uh, um, is in. Uh, uh, has production facilities. And on the, on the more traditional pay TV side of things, I think a longer term lockdown will see a lot of pay TV churn if professional sports do not uh, resume in the August, September time period. Any longer than that, and people will cancel their subscriptions, not only for the sports um, premium services, but also for the whole service that's the danger that we are facing but as i said we are assuming that uh, the uh, worst of it will be over by august and so the professional sports will uh, return to no well not to normal service because i think a lot of it will be uh, behind closed doors at least for the beginning of the season so here's quite a few numbers um we think that overall revenues for European TV, and when I say European, I'm, I'm talking about 40 countries here, uh, will reach $70 billion by 2025. That's up from $53 billion in 2019. Uh, OTT revenues will grow by $20 billion to $36 billion. So OTT share of the total will climb from 31% in 2019 to 52% i.e. more than half, in 2025. Uh, when, I, when I refer to OTT in this presentation, I'm talking about TV series and episodes. I'm not talking about other things such as um, premium sport. Um, and also another thing that you should know about these figures uh, in this slide is the OTT figures include AVOD, uh, which is going to be worth about $9 billion by 2025, but the pay TV figures did not include pay TV advertising, so they're not exactly like with like. So, um, pay TV revenues, traditional pay TV revenues, are going to fall by $4 billion uh, during this period as well. And these traditional pay TV revenues will fall in all but four of the 40 countries that we've covered in our forecast. 
I think a truer reflection when you're comparing um, OTT with pay TV is to look at the look at the subscription side of things. So for OTT, that's the SVOD side of things, and uh, for pay TV, it's obviously pay TV subscriptions. So uh, total subscription revenue across 40 countries will be $53 billion by 2025, and that's up by $10 billion on 2019. SVOD will add $14 billion to take its total to $23 billion. But pay TV, as I said before, will fall by $4 billion to $30 billion. So just as a comparison, in Western Europe, it, um, its SVOD revenues in 2025 will represent 88% of its pay TV total, and that's up from only 31% in 2019. So obviously, um, SVOD's share of the total is growing as time goes on. Eastern Europe, Eastern, Eastern European take-up rates for SVOD are a lot different from Western Europe, but um, Eastern Europe SVOD will take up 34% um, of total revenues in 2025, and that's up from only 12% in 2019. Now, um, this this chart gives you some idea of how uh, things are developing and why Eastern Europe's a bit slower to take up uh, uh, a lot of services. Um, pay TV subscription fees in Eastern Europe are really low, especially in Russia, and Russia accounts for about half of what goes on in the TV world in Eastern Europe. So Eastern European SVOD ARPU figures are already higher than the traditional pay TV figures. And that, of course, uh, of course will affect take up because people are thinking, I can get lots of channels on the pay TV service for cheaper than I can get one SVOD platform. Um, Western European SVOD is lower than the pay TV total, but that's going to grow and it'll be very close to the pay TV ARPU figure by 2025. Now, what's happening is um, pay TV ARPUs are falling as more subscribers take up bundle services. Uh, when they take up bundle services uh, by adding broadband or, or telephony, they are paying less for the TV services by definition. Uh, whereas on, on the S5 side of things, we think that SVOD subscribers will take more and more SVOD subscriptions as they as they launch and come on the stream. So SVOD ARPUs are up. Pay TV, pay TV ARPUs are going to fall. And this is, uh, uh, again, a comparison chart between um, SVOD subscribers and pay TV subscribers. So in total, we are forecasting 90, uh, 286 million paying subscribers. And I should stress paying because there's a lot of free stuff going on at the moment paying subscribers by 2025 and that's up from 249 million in 2019. Now these figures are for net SVOD subscribers. Uh, uh, um, an SVOD subscriber can have more than one SVOD subscription. Um, the number of net uh, SVOD subscribers will nearly double to 108 million by 2025. And as you can see from this chart, the Western European SVOD subscriber total, so not the gross subscriptions, subscriber total will be fast approaching the pay TV total by 2025. Pay TV is going to, across Europe is going to lose 7 million subscribers to fall to 178 million by 2025. Now that's bad, but it's really not anywhere nearly as bad as what's happening in the US, for example. Um, and in fact, pay TV, pay TV penetration of TV households will still be at 59% of uh, TV households by 2025. That's down, only down from 61% in 2019. So the, nut, the level of um, pay TV penetration is not going to change that much in the, in the next few years. Um, we're not going to see mass cord cutting as has happened in the US. Um, net SVOD subscribers represent 38% of TV households by 2025. Um, so that's up from 22% in 2019 and still quite a way behind traditional pay TV penetration. Oops. Okay, 
this just just to make the point this this chart shows um, how uh, how many subscriptions how many SVOD subscriptions the average Netflix SVOD subscriber will take so the average SVOD subscriber will take more than two subscriptions by 2025 and uh, that's up from only one and a half in 2019 so the number of subscriptions will grow faster than the number of subscribers and as I said before the um, pandemic has, has actually pushed subscriptions very fast and there have been some very interesting results uh, last night from Disney which uh, has uh, which which said it's actually got 54 and a half million subscriptions now to its Disney Plus service uh, despite the fact that it only started in November last year. And in fact, there was a big push between uh, the end of March and the date when those figures were given, the 54 and a half million was at the 4th of May. By the end of March, they were, uh, Disney said they only had 33 and a half million subscribers. So the difference, a lot of the difference, not all of it, is the fact that Disney Plus launched in a lot of, um, key Western European countries at the end of March and in France's case in early April. So I think what Disney is doing is um, pre-selling subscriptions so it gets a big boost when those services launch in a country and then it settles down a bit in those countries. But um, anyway, more on that later. Okay, so this is, this is where a lot of the, these subscriptions are taking place. Uh, Again, I would stress that these are only for paying subscriptions. Uh, a lot of services are offering free um, online subscriptions, whether that be uh, to subscribers of a premium TV channel or um, to, a, to a service such as Apple TV Plus. Well, I'll get on to that later. Anyway, every country is going to show strong growth. The UK will remain the market leader. Uh, doubling its subscription numbers in, uh, between 2019 and 2025. Worth pointing out in this, this chart as well is Italy. Italy's been pretty slow to take up SVOD so far, but we're expecting very strong growth in the next few years. Um, the same was true with France. France was very slow to adopt um, SVOD for various reasons, uh, but Netflix is now very popular there, and there are also some homegrown services, and we're expecting some pretty high, strong take up uh, of Disney Plus, for example. Uh, as you'll notice, all three, all of the countries mentioned in, in this chart are Western European. Take up is much lower in Eastern Europe. Um, in Russia and Poland, Russia and Poland will each have about nine million subscribers each by 2025 so um, quite a way down on this chart and again on the revenue side of things um, no surprises that services in, in Western Europe are generally more expensive than services in Eastern Europe um, the UK will continue to be the leader as far as revenues are concerned but its market share will be eroded somewhat as other countries catch up to what's going on in the UK. Now I mentioned um, differences between East and Western Europe. Russia is a very interesting example. Of course, Russia is the most populous country in Europe. Um, it's a lot different from anything else is happening, not just in Eastern Europe, but anywhere else in Europe. Um, the government is very wary of foreign media companies and it has threatened to clamp down on uh, foreign SVOD platforms if they get too big. Um, this has made this has made the fair uh, quite a few of the platforms fairly wary of pushing too hard in, in Russia, and as you'll see from the top right-hand corner of this pie, pie chart, four of the global players, Netflix, Amazon, Disney Plus, and Apple TV, will have a pretty small subscriber bases even by 2025. However, some, there are some local companies that are emerging out of this. And one worth mentioning is a Mediateka, which has a, uh, an exclusive uh, deal to carry HBO content. So HBO isn't actually inter entering the, the Russian market at all on its own. It's relying at the moment, at least, on a Mediateka. 
Um, but even, even the local companies will have fairly low penetration rates. As I said before, Russians are not used to paying much for TV services. So uh, we, it, uh, uh, the SVOD subscription concept is quite a hard sell for them. Okay, this is not just Eastern Europe or Russia. This is back to the whole of Europe, the whole all 40 countries that we are talking about. Um, SVOD revenues will increase by $14 billion between 2019 and 2025. Netflix is going to add $4.6 billion, nearly doubling its total. Um, Netflix's newer competitors, younger competitors, are generally cheaper than Netflix, which is a very interesting move by them. Netflix has regularly increased its prices in, in uh, the last few years. Um, and in fact, some of the prices have been quite, price hikes have been quite high, but these cheaper competitors may make it hesitate about increasing its prices any further. Look at Disney Plus. Now, we made these forecasts before uh, the, um, the announcement last night, but even so, we're, we're expecting Disney Plus to add a staggering 5.3, 5.4 billion dollars in the next few years. So together, Netflix and Disney Plus will account for more than two thirds of export revenues in Europe by 2025. And on the subscription side of things, the five global US based players mentioned here will take 80% of European subscriptions by 2025. And in fact, they're increasing their market share. Uh, that will be up from 73% in 2019. What's happened in the last few years is local players are, have become much more wary about launching their own services. Um, it's easier for mobile operators, telcos, and pay TV operators to form a partnership with one of uh, the, uh, an established player, not necessarily the ones listed here, but quite often the ones listed here, uh, because the brands are very well known. Um, and also the partnership gives the uh, operators the chance to um, uh, to promote these services and adds kudos to their service and it also means they don't take so many risks as far as programming content is, is concerned and expensive uh, especially exclusive content is concerned so it's a it's a it's a it's a beneficial for both sides because players such as the ones listed on this um, platform don't have to take the ben benefits themselves they don't have to sorry they don't have to take the payment themselves they can rely on a third party to take the payment and uh, the reason why i'm saying that's important is because in a lot of european countries credit card ownership is very low so um getting people to to spend money for a service directly can be quite a um, time consuming operation expensive operation for the for the platforms um Netflix, despite being the most mature um, platform listed on this chart, will add 19 million subscribers during this period to take its total to 75.5. It's going to take, it still it will remain the market lead in Europe. It'll take a third of the total by 2025, but this is down from a 47% share in 2019. Now, a lot of Netflix is market share loss is down to the um, emergence of Disney Plus. As I said, Disney Plus launched in several key um, European countries in March. It launched first in the Netherlands in November last year. It has promised to launch in most Western European countries by the middle of the year and in most Eastern European countries by the end of 2020. So we are anticipating 60 million subscribers to Disney by 25, which is quite staggering growth. Uh, I'll, I'll explain a bit more about it later. As I mentioned before, the forecasts were undertaken before the results announced by Disney yesterday. And we are revising those figures at the moment. And I think the figure actually will, by 2025, will reduce it to 50 to 55 million subscribers um, I think we got a bit excited 
with the 60 million figures, but we're not going to reduce it by that much. It's still going to be pretty high. Disney will be the second biggest player in Europe by 2025. Um, HBO is also worth mentioning. Uh, HBO has online operations in Eastern Europe, the Nordic countries, Spain and Portugal. However, it's limit, it has been limited so far to uh, expanding elsewhere because HBO has an exclusive deal with Sky in its five territories, uh, with OCS in France and with Zigo in the Netherlands, uh, uh, as well as several other companies around Europe. So HBO Max may not launch in its own right in a lot of those countries. Uh, HBO, uh, Warner Media has the choice of, of three, three choices. Uh, continuing their um, exclusive deals with these companies and, and uh, beyond the, uh, the, the current um, license. Um, setting up their own HBO Max untried platform after these licenses, and a lot of these licenses are very lucrative, after they expire, or setting up some sort of joint venture S4 platform with these partners. And I think that might be the most likely scenario after these exclusive deals, or even during these exclusive deals. So, as I mentioned before, Netflix and Disney Plus will be the market leaders by 2025. Both of these companies are available in nearly every European country. Um, however, as you can see from this chart, their subscriber bases are concentrated uh, within the big five Western European countries. Now, Disney Plus, as I said before, announced that it had uh, 54 and a half million paying subscribers around the world, and, and they haven't even launched in a lot of countries yet by Monday. So it's really taken off very quickly. Um, I think the reasons behind that are, are because it's a very well known brand. Um, parents think that Disney's content is safe for their children to watch, uh, it's fairly cheap in, Europe, in Western European terms, anyway. Um, it also appeals to a younger audience who will watch the same content repeatedly. Um, so this puts less emphasis on Disney Plus to uh, uh, introduce more originals, a, a lot of originals. It will int introduce originals, but it doesn't have the same, um, it doesn't have the same pressure to do so that other platforms have because other platforms are, are usually appealing to adults and adults want new content all the time. Now, um, Disney has a lot of pluses. One of, one of the um, perhaps negatives for Disney is the fact that it only appeals to children. So um, it doesn't appeal to adults, therefore it limits its potential target audience um, to families basically. Now, in, in the States, it has a Hulu, uh, which appeals to adults and takes content from Disney, Fox, and uh, ABC. Um, but it does not have that, it doesn't have that, um, it, Hulu does not exist yet in Europe, although there have been some talk, there has been some talk about doing so, but I think it'd be quite hard for, it is, for Hulu to launch in, in European countries because of existing deals it has with other players. Now here, here are two of the other uh, uh, major international players that are available in Europe. The thing about Amazon and Apple uh, TV Plus is Amazon and Apple, uh, the parents, see their S4 platforms as a means of selling more of their other products. So Amazon Prime Video is free to um, subscribers of Amazon Prime. Uh, Apple TV Plus is free for a year, at the moment anyway, to buyers of Apple's top tier products. Now, the, this would, I think this affects how many people are actually paying for the service, but it also affects their parent company's commitment to, uh, financial commitment to these, these, these platforms. So they might be quite reluctant to up the content budgets, the original content budgets for these platforms, if they don't see a return. 
because these two platforms are not profit centers in their own right. Amazon Prime Video's impact outside Amazon Prime countries is very limited. Um, Amazon Prime operates in nine European countries. Um, it costs the same to subscribe to Amazon Prime, so you get the free, uh, the free delivery and, and the rapid delivery, um, as well as the, the video ownership. So there's no reason why people should take uh, a standalone subscription to Amazon Prime Video because they get more with Amazon Prime. So we don't think many people are actually going to subscribe to Amazon Prime Video in Amazon Prime countries. Um, but what we do think is that there will only be one and a half million um, Amazon Prime Video subscribers paying for Amazon Prime Video uh, in the 31 countries that do not have Amazon Prime. Um, on Apple TV Plus's side of things, um, Again, I mentioned it's free for a year to um, top Apple product buyers. Um, now, I don't think many of those people are actually going to subscribe to the service afterwards. Uh, it's fairly limited in what it offers. There's not much original content. And we're only expecting 4.3 million subscribers to Apple TV Plus across Europe by 2025. Okay. This is the whole uh, revenue base for uh, the OTC services across all 40 European countries. So uh, OTT revenues will increase by $20 billion between uh, 2019 and 2025 to reach $36 billion. s share of the total is actually going to increase from 55% in 2019 to 63% in 2025. Now, a, a lot of people have talked about AVOD. People are getting very excited about AVOD uh, before the crisis hit. Um, there are some top American companies that are launching services. Peacock and uh, Hulu have uh, obviously uh, big advertising drivers in the US. They might not necessarily um, uh, expand to the international markets of those. They have said they are considering it, but they might not do so because um, they haven't got the program rights that they have in the States elsewhere. So um, advertising confidence was hit very hard by the uh, COVID pandemic. And I think what we're going to see is a dip in AVOD growth during 2020. We're not going to see a fall, I don't think, in, in, in advertising revenues for AVOD because AVOD is a newer medium. Uh, it's a younger medium and it's a faster growing medium than uh, other more traditional things such as newspapers, magazines and TV. Also, uh, during the pandemic, more people have watched online. So that pushes up audience and advertisers will pay more for higher audiences. However, um, people can't buy what's being advertised uh, or get access to it necessarily. So that means the impact of advertising is diminished. So that's why we think advertising uh, expenditure is going to dip into 2020, excuse me. But how, but we believe, we believe, <coughs> excuse me, we believe, <coughs> we, be, <coughs> we believe that AVOD will continue to grow uh, quite high in quite high terms after that. Excuse me. Um, right. So, um, AVOD revenue is going to reach $8.8 .8 billion by 2025, uh, and that's double the 2019 total. Um, these revenues are just based on TV series and movies, not based on UGC. Um, so, I mean, if you add UGC, for example, the figures would be much higher. We are forecasting that YouTube will generate $1.8 billion in Avon revenue just for professionally made movies and um, TV series screened on its platform. Um, Facebook will bring in another billion dollars. However, the biggest category in Europe is going to be free to wear broadcasters, uh, which will bring in $3.3 billion by 2025.
Okay, returning to the more traditional uh, pay TV market, as I say, um, we're expecting professional sports to resume in August. And with that, uh, we're expecting people to resume their, uh, their premium sports subscriptions. Um, the number of subscriptions overall will fall from 185 million in 2019 to 278 million in 2025. Um, IPTV will be the biggest winner by some distance. Now there are still nearly 17 million analog cable subscribers uh, at the end of 2019. A lot of those were in Eastern Europe. Um, they will slowly, and in some cases very slowly, be switched off or converted to other um, services. They might not convert necessarily to other digital pay um, platforms because they can't afford it or they're just not that interested in what's on offer. And they might just become free to air DTT subscribers. Now, Russia is the biggest uh, single country as far as pay TV subscribers are concerned in Europe. However, it's also going to be the biggest loser. It will lose nearly 3 million subscribers between 2019 and 2025. And in fact, 30 of the 40 countries we cover will lose subscribers between 2019 and 2025. Now, as I mentioned before, pay TV revenue is going to fall by $4 billion between 2019 and 2025 to $31 billion. IPTV will be the only platform to gain revenues. On the right hand side, you see Poland appears in the top five countries by revenues. Um, Poland's revenues are higher than Russia's, despite the fact that Russia is a much bigger country. Um, because subscription rates in, in Russia are much lower than uh, in Poland, and in fact, in most other countries. Thank you. Now that concludes the uh, um, presentation side of things. What I'm going to do now is um, answer any questions that, that might have um, appeared. I can find them. Just bear with me. Okay. We have a question. Um, what do you think Amazon's game plan is with acquiring sports rights? In, for example, in Benelux. Uh, yeah, Amazon has acquired sports rights in, in, in various countries. Um, it's uh, including the US. Um, it's it sort of dipped its toes into the market rather than gone for a full-blown um, top package. I think it's a good way of attracting pack uh, of, of of customers to their services, especially their Amazon Prime services. And I think I think what uh, Amazon's doing is um, trying to boost its Prime subscriptions overall rather than its Prime Video subscriptions. Um, next question: Esford is a challenger. But is there anything incumbents like pay TV can do to respond? <laughs> okay, that's interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, well, some of them have started their own S4 platforms, but as I mentioned during the presentation, um, a lot of the pay TV operators are now uh, joining forces with the S4 platforms. And in fact, uh, there, there seems to be more kudos gained uh, by the num by having the having the most um, S4 platforms on your um, pay TV service. I mean, in the UK, there are, you know, some of the services now take nearly all of the top players, including, uh, amazing enough, Amazon Prime Video. Amazon Prime Video was always um, uh, sort of a bit, slow, let's say it was a bit slower to take on um, a, a partnership with a, with a, a pay TV operator, uh, but it's now doing so uh, across the world. Um, Karen, I think that's it. I can't see any other questions there. Perfect. Thank you, Simon. That was really interesting. It was it was really good to see all the facts and the figures on screen in front of us.
thank you and thanks we really appreciate your time in putting it all together for us as well pleasure i hope there weren't too many. oh hang on there's one more oh, there's another more. question okay okay um where do we where do you see sky's position in the uk in the long run since the pay tv market is declining yes um pay to, sky is losing um, um satellite tv uh, subscribers and has been do doing so for some time in the uk um what Sky has experimented with, and remember Sky is available in five European countries, what's it, what's it, what it has experimented with uh, is um, offering its services online. And it, it, it has experimented with doing that in Austria, um, uh, where it actually offered the bundles online to subscribers. And I think that this is, a longer term forward. Sky has gone a bit quiet about it recently, but it had said that it wanted to convert a lot of its subscribers over to online delivery. I think I think the, what's holding it back, one of the major factors that's holding it back is, is what they call latency, which is the, the delay in sports between uh, the action and, deli and actually seeing it online. And the, and the latency period for online is longer than traditional TV is. But I think, I think, the likes of Sky are very interested in getting online. <coughs> no more? I don't. If anybody's got any more questions, you can always email uh, Simon directly or you can email on info at ctameurope.com and I will forward them over. If you wish to view the presentation again, so you can look over the facts and figures, this will be uploaded onto the members only section of ctameurope.com alongside all the past webinars and podcasts on there from CTAM Europe and also CTAM US. So I hope you all enjoyed it. Next week, we have got two webinars actually. Um, Wednesday, we've got Bernd Riefler from Veed Analytics presenting premium SVOD and MVPD, product challenges and ties between them both. And then on Thursday, we've added another um, webinar on as a one-off. It's a discussion and a Q&A session following up from last week's webinar that we had for, from Natalie Lethbridge and Adam Cunningham. Um, it's a follow-up session from the webinar on theatrical releases and whether the lockdown is the time to transform transactional VOD. So thanks again, Simon. It was really great of you to do it for us. So wish everybody, um, everybody keeps safe and wishing you all a great week. Thanks a lot. Goodbye.